on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. Some authors say, well, I can read my own work because I know it the best. Well, sure you do, but do you have the skill set to engage the audience? Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers, no more barriers, no one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome. It is The Self-Publishing Show, the very last one of 2021. I am James Blatch. And I am Mark Dawson. And I, I'm, I'm sure I speak for everyone when I say, um, and I'm not going to swear, but F off 2021. And let's hope that 2022 is much better, less less viral. It won't be. No, it probably won't be. That's true. But Maybe good we luck can with we that. can we can hope that. I think the key is just try and make the most of life in between those uh, things <laughs> that throws at us. Yes, I mean exactly. I'm hoping when this this goes out that I will be in a ski resort in Europe, but right. everything looks yeah, everything looks dodgy. Um, mm. We will see. Anyway, uh, we're trying to carry on as normal as much as possible, which I think is one way of doing it. That's and the way, yeah. focus on our, our things that we want to do, which in this case for the show means writing and selling your books, which is what we're going to talk about today. In fact, specifically audio books, but that's to come in a moment. Before then, we have some Patreon supporters to welcome to the self-publishing show. We do. So we have Matt Cleary from New South Wales, Australia, and Marie Burdeen Stein of No Address. Um, so okay. we don't know where um, Marie Burdeen lives, but we thank them both nonetheless. So thanks very much for supporting the show. Um, we we always, I probably don't mention it enough really, but we, we have a collection of very generous patrons who help us put the show together as we kind of push on towards 400 shows it's pretty crazy isn't it but um but it wouldn't Indeed. be possible without without those guys so we're, we're very grateful um to them for their continued support thank you matt and well done in the first ashes test matt maybe by maybe by new year's eve the series will be level probably <laughs> unlikely <not. laughs> unlikely yeah okay um we are also going to talk about our tiktok expedition which is a uh, sort of challenge you can take part in which if you follow the five steps over five days will help you get a foothold in a new platform which is something uh, to use mark's expression is moving the needle on sales for books and lots of examples that we've seen so we're quite excited about the power of tiktok for all authors uh if you are slightly anxious about a new platform don't know where to start this is the ideal thing for you to take part in and if you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash tiktok you'll get a series of emails with videos and things to follow uh, to do it now i've put these videos together they are really good they're really good, actually, yeah. I, yeah, yeah i followed it as well i've posted my first um I, I, I was already on the platform a bit, so I did a couple of stupid things, but I've posted my first kind of bookish, book talk post. I did another one yesterday, and I'm going to make a, a good effort at trying to establish something on there. Yeah, I will, I, I will do that too. Um, I, one thing I would say is we've seen quite a lot of people in the... In the or, by the way, we have over 3,000 people doing the challenge now and 1,000 people in the Facebook group that we've set up to kind of um, go along with it. And one of the things I see a lot is two things, really, two kind of threads. Some people are saying, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to sing and I'm not going to dance. It's just uh, all these yeah. things are, these things are inane and ridiculous. Um, and yeah, some of them I've seen are inane and ridiculous. Um, and I'm not going to sing and dance either, but you know, th there are other ways to, to get that content out there. So um, I wouldn't close yourself off to that possibility without thinking about how you could do it. Well, and the other thing um, I, I will say is, um, People saying you know, my genre it only works for romance. Now I, I've seen um, examples in all genres where this is working, um, but the example I posted into the group the other day, just something I found, just I think it was on the verge. Um, I can't remember her name now, Zoe something, but she's uh, she teaches people how to do Excel, and she's making you now get this, this is ridiculous, six figures a day um, through <laughs> six figures a day. So what, what's that? What's that a year annual salary? I don't know. It depends on how high the six figures are, but, um, yeah. even if it was a hundred thousand a day, that's 300,000 a year. That's uh, three, nearly three and three and a half, four million a year, just from TikToks. I'm saying, um, courses on how to, to do Excel, which is absolutely unbelievable. But, um, I think it's one, 1 1.2 million, isn't it? Yeah. 12, well, 12 times a hundred thousand. Yeah. Sorry. You're absolutely right. Yeah. No, no, no. A hundred thousand a day. 
A hundred thousand a day. It's not oh. a month. It's six oh, figures a day. Yeah, it's it's about three and a half million, three, three, four, four million. So James is uh, just checking that. Oh, there, but it's goodness. about three point six, isn't it? So she's she's doing incredible numbers. No, it's thirty six um, million. Is it thirty six million? Is it thirty six point five million? I think a <laughs> hundred thousand a day. That is ridiculous. 100. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, it's, it's a million every ten days. Yes, yeah, right? it's, it's thirty six. Yeah, thirty six million. So um, that's <laughs> well, that so is ludicrous. We're, we're definitely not. We're not promising that. That's for sure. No, but but you know, it's a guarantee. Just, You'll make at least yeah, thirty God. million if yeah, you go on TikTok. Um, not not a guarantee, says Mark the lawyer. But um, so it is. It is something that people are in across all genres, all kinds of content they're making uh, they're selling a lot of their stuff as my dog starts eating something behind me um, so yeah so come along it's going to be interesting yeah. and um I, i've seen the videos they're really good um and i think it'll be quite a fun little introduction before yeah. the the full new module uh the 10 hours of content that we've got in the as for authors course which opens what in about 10 days time i think as this goes yes yeah, something like that uh wednesday the i'll look up the date in a second but yeah the the course is very comprehensive um uh, done by Lila and Jane. Yeah, 10 hours of very detailed instruction of how to actually build your platform and get going uh, beyond just simply establishing yourself, which is what the uh, the expedition's about, as much as we can do in a kind of challenge like that. Uh, yeah, so we will open the course. We'll have more about that probably next week on the 12th of January. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I would say to people who, who first set up their account or they first look at TikTok and they see people dancing and lip syncing, um, of course, there's an algorithm at work there. When you first go on there, TikTok has no idea who you are or what you're interested in. And it's going to send some videos to you that have, have they've got like a million views because they're popular with the mass market. But my TikTok feed is full of people with green screen behind them talking about space and astronomy and, and aviation and stories. From, and they're not dancing and singing and lip syncing uh, or and golden retrievers. Quite a lot of that because I saved them <laughs> for my wife. To see. So very quickly. Not combined though. Golden Retrievers in space. No, that, that would be good. I haven't had that yet. Probably will be at some point. So very quickly the algorithm starts serving you stuff that you want to see. So don't be put off by the first few um, posts you see. That's not, that's not how it works. Um, uh, there are a couple of quite happy um, accounts which is which do feature dancing which you should throw in there. There's one called Happy Kelly. I'd recommend her because she's just brilliant video effects they do on their um, their dancing as well. And we all need a little uh, lift every now and again. Here's okay. a question for you. Go on. Name of the first dog in space. Kika? Something Laika. like that. L Laika. Good try. Really. Yeah, what happened to Laika? Let's not go there on a family-friendly <laughs> podcast because uh, it's just it's disturbing. Don't look it up if you love dogs. Um, okay, right, here we go. Uh, we are Ooh, talking... Hang on, oh, I, interrupt on. I interrupted you before you gave the URL for the TikTok challenge, didn't I? So I think I may um, have given it. I will give it again. Selfpublishingformula.com forward slash TikTok, T-I-K-T-O-K, um, to join us in that. And at the moment, there's a... There's a, a a hashtag to go with your first post which is the result of day five and at the moment i am the only person of course i've edited the course and had a sneak preview so i'm looking forward to being joined on that um that yes. uh, hashtag at some point by a few thousand other people and we could all follow each other so you know we'll get to a thousand followers plus which is a key point you'll yeah, discover yeah. during yeah. the challenge might, getting a thousand followers yeah. opens up things like live uh, aspect to you and stuff so yeah. let's all do that okay uh right are we ready now to talk about the interview? I think we are. Because we have Kelly Rin on today. And uh, I saw Kelly in person at 20 Books. And Tom and Mark and I and John, we went through a lot of the sessions at the 20 Books Conference in Vegas in November and tried to pick out one people who were giving really good value-added talks. I thought we could have them as guests. And Kelly was definitely one of those. Uh, she's uh, uh, She owns Spectrum Audiobooks which is you'll find out a kind of production service uh, that you can use as an author, but she's also incredibly knowledgeable and geeky about audiobooks, their place in the ecosystem, where they're going, uh, how to get them right, how to get the right narrator, a really good uh, all-round discussion on audiobooks. I've just been through the process with mine. I outsourced the production to a company in the UK, got the raw files back, so they're mine, and I'm able to upload them anywhere. I've decided to go exclusive with uh, ACX for the first 90 day period um, and then I'll decide what I'm going to do probably think I might go wide after that I've had 45 sales so far is that good I don't know um, I mean, also it's a slightly yeah. odd 
dashboard on ACX because you can't yeah, really awful. see. It's awful. I have no idea how much that's generating me. And the it's, 20 quid. No, it's awful. I, I, I mean, I love Amazon and I love most Amazon companies, but ACX, the information you get is just terrible. Um, so I'm doing this with my German ones at the moment because I've had an offer for German um, audio from a from um, a publisher. And I think it's probably better for me to do it myself. Um, but just trying to work out the numbers is really difficult. You can't work out how much it, you're making per sale, which is like the most fundamentally important yeah. piece of information. I can't run ad campaigns. I, I think it's about, this is, others you know, may want to leave a message in the comments, but I, I think it's about four pounds per copy is around about the, um, the amount that you make um, on sales. But, you know, the only way you'll know is when you get paid at the end of the month, divide that by the sales you made in that month and work out just on average what you're getting yeah. per download. But it's not satisfactory at all. No, no. Well, I'm waiting for the end of my first month. But uh, from where I am at the moment, looking for advertising money just to break even, that's a decent chunk of change that's come in mm. uh, on the audiobook. And I am running a specific audiobook campaign in in Facebook, targeting people, interests who are also audible, mm -hmm. interested. Um, and that, yeah. I've no idea whether that's generated the sales or my mailing list or whatever, but um, uh, I will try and work that out as time goes on. Okay, anyway, let's talk to Kelly and uh, Mark and I'll be back for a chat. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. So Kelly Rennie, actually that's quite a good name, Kelly Rennie. Thank you. <laughs> nice rhyming, uh, so it's quite fun to say. Welcome to the, um, the self-publishing show. And we are talking about audio, things that are nice to say and listen to. We're going to be talking about audiobooks, <laughs> Spectrum in particular. But I think we'll talk a bit about the audiobook market uh, in general. Why don't you introduce yourself, Kelly, and let us know uh, your, um, your journey to this point. Elevator pitch. Um, I started in opera. Um, I also have a background in technology and programming, and which is a very strange background. And I spent 16 years in opera. And then I quit that industry. And I went full blown into website development. And at the same time, I started uh, working in radio. Uh, I was uh, hosting a classical music program and live opera from the Opera House here in Detroit, Michigan. And then I started doing internet radio. And then I developed a uh, live video streaming for my husband's company. And one thing led to another and a friend of mine wanted me to help her with her studio and help her set it up. And I said, sure, I'll help you set up your studio. And, and I said, why are you setting up a studio? And she says, I'm going to narrate audio books. Beat, beat, beat. You should do this. I said, Okay, so I went out on ACX the way everyone else does, and I auditioned, and I got three books, and hundred books later, and a publishing company, and <laughs> wow. here we are. Yeah, I always, uh, I've always liked running a company. I've always liked being my own boss. So I never really was comfortable with the whole work for hire thing that narration tends to be. So I went into it always with the plan of of having a publishing firm and i i found out that i really enjoy it sure so you didn't publish traditional <laughs> books i mean you know non-audio books before this you had or did you have any background in publishing not at all okay. not at all <laughs> and is spectrum just audio books not now. It was originally, but I've had a couple of authors who came to me and basically said, I want to write. I I don't want to fool with ebooks. I don't want to fool with print. I just want to stay and write. And I said, okay. And, you know, there are so many great people in this industry and people who were very willing to share knowledge. Um, you know, obviously you and I both know the 20 books to 50K group. And it's been a fabulous resource. And so, you know, I had to, I had to scale up pretty quickly, you know, in order to accommodate those folks. And uh, it's, it's been one heck of a journey. And I just did my first full blown wide distribution in print as well, which was a real challenge. <laughs> wide audio, I was very familiar with, but but wide print was... Uh... So as you as you grew Spectrum, who were your typical authors? These self-published authors who had their books already up online and you, you just looked after the audio side for them? Uh, correct. 
Yes, uh, and mostly in the lit RPG genre because I was narrating for them. And so it turned into, well, why don't you just handle everything? And I said, okay, you know, sure, I'll do that. And so I started in lit RPG and then um, I've had a fantastic partnership with a couple of author agents where they basically just send me everything you know, knew that their authors are doing. So in that way, Spectrum ended up becoming more of a generalist than specializing in, oh, say, lit RPG or science fiction or romance or general fiction. We just kind of became more of a, a large portal and a generalist than anything specific. Yeah, it seems pretty broad mm -hmm. now because I had a look at the uh, the website before we came on and um, yeah, I think you've got you got most bases covered there one way and another. <laughs> and yesterday I just had a, a, a great meeting with an author that's doing nonfiction. So okay. we'll now be adding that as well. So uh, and you can't possibly still be narrating all these audiobooks now. So I assume <laughs> oh, you, no, you have no. a bit of a team. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, quite a few narrators, probably probably a couple hundred at this point um 110 authors i think um and then we add new narrators all the time so depending on the authors uh i will open auditions up to new narrators uh especially those with a little bit less experience so that they can get some under their belt because larger publishers usually won't do that and you know for other folks, you know, I go to my roster. I say, okay, this person is going to be a perfect fit for your book. And, you know, and I let the author take a listen. But the authors do get to choose. Um, I don't demand that they use someone. I'll usually give them a selection. I'll say, here are three women I think are great. Here are three men. Uh, you know, if it's a duet, I've got a lot of couples that work together. And, uh, and I just pass those on and, and cast that way. Okay, so I want, I'm just making a note because I want to talk to you about narrator choice when we, we come on to that. But just so I understand sure. the sort of process and the model, what, what's the attraction for an author then signing with Spectrum? And Because the, there's a trouble with audiobooks. There's quite a myriad of choices available to authors now. But <laughs> what's the attraction of, of being signed by, by Spectrum? I, the fact that we pretty much handle everything soup to nuts. You know, uh, with some companies... Uh, they will only produce your audio and you're responsible for distribution or other companies are distribution only and you're responsible for getting your audio produced. So this way, uh, you know, they can come to us, uh, they can be as involved as they want to be or as hands off as they want to be. And that was something that I always wanted to have from the very beginning because, you know, Narration is a creative process as much as writing is a creative process. And I love what happens when I put narrators and an author together in a Zoom meeting and they get to have that initial meeting and just talk about the book. It's it's really incredible. And it's something that, you know, not a lot of folks will do. You know, um, I, I've seen some other companies that really just churn stuff out yeah. and, you know, it's not not my mindset not the way you you operate and what are the offers to um to authors what uh what royalty rate can they expect uh really we've done what is sort of an industry standard they have some some options and it really depends on how much control of their masters that they want to have so uh if they want complete control of their masters then um you know, we do ask them to cover the narration fees. We cover everything else and they get 75% of the royalties or more. I have, I have a couple of authors that are a little bit higher than that. We do a 50-50 split where we just split everything right down the middle, split the, split the narration fees, split the royalty rates. And then the last option that we have is when Spectrum covers all of the costs and then we give the authors 35% until their book earns back. Uh, if we pay in advance, if it earns back the advance, uh, then we switch to a 50% model. 
Okay. So it's two tiered. So some good yeah. options. So that's, and that's quite interesting, the 75% yeah. option, because that's almost like the aggregating sites that, that kind of take the grind for, for um, authors out of it, particularly wide, there's so many channels. But you effectively, you, you're like a human version of an aggregator site where you just do all that. <laughs> Pretty <Yeah>. much. <laughs> yeah, I can see the attraction of that. So I've, I've just done my audiobook, um, literally, in the last few days. In fact, it went live about three days ago. In fact, I noticed it's number two in the military thriller's most wished for book today, which I was really excited about. Oh, good. Congratulations. So, yeah, thank you. So <laughs> starting to do a little bit of promo for it. Um, but like lots of people, slightly overwhelmed with the choices of channels of where to go. And I've opted at least for the initial 90 days to be exclusive with ACX. It seemed like the my, like most straightforward thing for me. But at some point, I'll have to make a decision because there are a lot of people everywhere everywhere in the world who don't necessarily use Audible. Uh, it sort of feels to me like in audiobooks more than ebooks that there there's an argument for being wide, is there? Very much so. Uh, the pandemic actually created a entirely new audience for wide distribution with things like Hoopla, Biblioteca, um, you know, uh, Libro.fm, Libby, you know, uh, places like that that let you do more of a library borrow model. And a lot of folks have switched over to that. They want their audiobooks, but they don't want to pay that monthly fee to Audible or Storytel or somewhere else. Um, Storytel is fantastic for folks that are outside of the United States. Um, you know, it, uh, you know, uh, the royalty rates are very, very good. Uh, they get the books in and distributed very, very quickly. Um, you know, I've seen uh, a lot of great stuff out of them. I really like them. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Find Away now that Spotify has bought them. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, three weeks ago, I was saying something completely different. And now it's all sort of a big question mark. So, you know, um, Hmm. Time, time will tell. Yeah. You know, on that uh, one. So, do you? Yeah. <laughs> are, are you wide with all your authors, or some of them exclusive yes. to ACX? No, all wide. Nope, everybody's wide. Yep, yep. And what I have found is that it works extremely well for authors that have back catalog, because they can do like you did. They can do the exclusive to ACX for the 90 days. And thank goodness that they changed that rule. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's been great for a lot of folks and they can get a lot of bang for their buck out of the, you know, hundred promo codes that they get through ACX and get those reviews coming in and put their back catalog in wide. And, you know, as we all know, every time you do a new release, you know, it does affect your back catalog. And that's where, you know, people really start to see that passive income start to tick up. So it usually takes about a year, yeah. you say. You know, but even with a new author, it works. It works, again, if you do it the way you're doing it. You do ACX first, and then you start to phase in because over time, your sales on ACX are going to drop. It's just... You know, it's unless you're constantly pouring money into promos with them and you might as well, you know, earn back some of that, you know, on the backside with the with the passive income. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned the lead time. I did read an article. Um, I've been reading quite a lot, obviously, having gone through <laughs> my own my own process. And I was a bit surprised and daunted to read that it can take 12, 13, 14 months to get your book everywhere. Um, seems mm -hmm. like a long lead time to me. Yeah, yeah. And again, it's it's just because there are so many channels. The average aggregator has anywhere from 30 to 50 channels that it needs to distribute on. So, yeah. you know, are you going to see sales from every single one of those? No. Yeah. You know, um, some of them are very small and they just don't have a lot of reach and you know, but I'll be interested in five years to see what this conversation looks like. <laughs> yeah, it is a changing world, isn't it? And there has been, you mentioned COVID, there has certainly been, uh, I, I mean, I can just tell it anecdotally, friends talking to me about listening to audiobooks who never mentioned them a couple of years ago. It feels to me like this is the, the, uh, the current booming area of publishing. Well, here's what's interesting about that was in February of 2020, Audiobooks were poised to overtake ebooks in the amount of sales. This comes from the Audio Publishers Association. They put those numbers out. And then, you know, we had the shutdown and 
everything tanked and we saw ebooks especially start to really climb and then audiobooks started to follow as people burned through their Netflix queue or you know, yeah. whatever they were <laughs> which is also why I started you know and I and I know you you probably want to go here and discuss this as well but that that uh, additional distribution channel on connected TVs mm. that, that that I've put together and yes. it was specifically because of that. Well, just explain that's the Roku. Correct. Yeah, yes. Just explain so, that. Okay. So, uh, connected TVs, smart TVs, OTT, it's all the same thing. It's all the cable cutter, uh, niche channels, um, you know, niche devices that people are using to stream all kinds of things. That's your Netflix, your Prime Video, Hulu, uh, Fubo, if you're into sports, Zumo, you know, Pluto, there's hundreds, they thousands of them. Yes, anything you want. But what there isn't are audiobooks. Now, what was interesting is there's plenty of radio channels and they're very popular. So obviously listening to audio on this device is, is done and I realize, and I've been in that space because of doing video streaming for years. So I was, I was already very familiar with it. And that's when I decided to put two and two together. And I thought, okay, let's, let's put together Roku and audiobooks and see where it goes. Uh, we're also working on Amazon Fire Stick and Xbox. So once all three phases are done, we'll be covered on all three of those devices. And who is Roku? Who owns Roku? So Roku is out of Texas, if I remember correctly. Um, and it basically is, uh, you know, it's a device. It's uh, although you now have it pre-installed on televisions, uh, at least here in the U.S. I don't know about the U.K. In the U.K., you can get the devices. Looks like a hockey puck. And you just connect it through an HDMI cable. And there are thousands of foreign language channels and sports and movies and public domain content, mostly in video, all kinds of government. I mean, just any possible niche you can imagine, mostly for video and television, like I said. And uh, it's been around since 2006, but it didn't really take off till 2016. And uh, in 2017, it had... 51 million installs, uh, devices that were in use. And now they're up to 91 million okay. devices that are in use. Okay. And they've just added their 18th country. So they just added Germany. Wow. So um, yeah. it's, it's effectively a bit like, I might like, like a fire stick or now TV we have in the UK devices you plug into your yes. TV and then it, it yes. enables lots of other services. Okay. Brilliant. Well, and it's the oldest one. Right. So that's the thing is that yeah. Amazon fire stick hasn't been around for that long. No. So, you know, Roku is really the, the grandfathered one. And it's why I started with that one because I know the platform the best and it's got the largest audience at this point. And finally, I want to ask about, because I remember interview, interviewing Lynn, uh, Lindsay Barroca um, a few months ago, and she had started at that point, whether she's still doing it, I don't know, putting up her entire audiobooks on YouTube and collecting the advertising revenue, um, which turned out to be not, not insignificant for. Is that a channel that you've looked at at all? Well, obviously it's there and it exists. And my biggest issue with something like Roku is the fact that it's easy for people to steal the content mm. off of our uh, YouTube. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, is that it's easy for people to steal the content. Whereas with a Roku device, it's almost impossible. And because there are so many people pirating content and putting it up on YouTube already, I really didn't want to go down that route. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a hard, it's a hard call to make because obviously with the right kind of content, Sure, the monetization on that, you know, could be great. But again, it just creates more work having to, you know, basically be a guard dog against because I already have to do that. Of course. Yeah. You know, I've, I've got to have somebody just constantly keeping their eye out, you know, for whether or not content has been pirated. Uh, it does feel 
counterintuitive if it doesn't uploading it to YouTube. It's certainly not something I'm going to do in the immediate future. But anyway, it's, I, I'm always interested in, in things that people do and they, they find work sure. for them. So I'll catch up with Lindsay at some point. Um, now, yeah, let's talk. A, I think it'd be really useful, if you don't mind, talking a little bit about some advice to authors who are going to go through the process. So, funny enough, I've just been through. Um, so choosing a narrator. I found that really difficult, I have to say. And I felt a little bit like <laughs> I was... You know when people put covers up and they, they tell the cover, the cover illustrator exactly what they want on the cover? And they're like the last people who should be telling a cover illustrator that because the cover illustrator <laughs> knows how to sell their book better than they do. And I felt, a, was that happening to me with the narrator choice? Or am I being picky about what my particular take on this is? Well, actually, I could have perhaps done with some help at that point. So can you can you give us some, some help when choosing a narrator? Sure, sure. Um, obviously... The, the the author always has a voice in their head and the voice in their head might not match what the narrator does. This is gets back to what I mentioned earlier about a narrator doesn't just read copy. That's not really what they do. I mean, they craft your story and the word craft is vital to what they do. And it's one of the reasons why there's so much anger over possibly, you know, artificial intelligence voices coming into narration, which is an entirely different discussion altogether. Um, storytelling is the oldest art there is. It's older than the written word. So if you think about it, um, letting that narrator bring a piece of creativity to your words is the most important thing that you can do. So to answer your question, um, I tell narrator authors to, to go into this with a very open mind. Try and ignore that voice in your head that you heard while you were writing it. That's, that's the one thing that's going to make it the most difficult to cast your book is you know, it, and you can, you're, you're, you're welcome to have, you know, what you want. That's not what I'm saying. What, what I'm saying is just, just let, let the creativity open up and flow and, and, you know, try and listen to your words in a different way. And most folks get that. Most folks usually are pretty excited to hear what a narrator brings to their text. Yeah, that's the way to think um, of it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But there is some prep that will help a narrator immensely, even just in the audition process. And you can use the same thing for working with the narrator, but, um, you know, having like a little cheat sheet that basically tells them, you know, what voice is it written in? Is it in first person? Is it in third person? Um, what point of view does the majority of the story take place in? If you've got characters with, unique names um, and you specifically want them pronounced uh, a, a certain way. I just had an audition come back and the author said, well, I really liked this narrator, but they pronounced this wrong. And I thought, well, we didn't know it was supposed to be, yeah. you didn't, you didn't tell us. So, <laughs> uh, you know, it's those kinds of things that will also make the process smoother. Um, if, you know, let's say you're doing fantasy or, or science fiction and you've created a very unique world, um, it, it's really helpful to just have a few sentences that describe that world for them because often an audition script is only uh, four pages, hmm. maybe, you know, um, you, you don't want them to only do 30 seconds and you definitely want, you want an, uh, an audition to come back to you. That's about three to four minutes long, maybe a little bit longer. You want some narrative and some dialogue, especially if there's dialogue between different genders of characters, because how some narrators handle opposite gender can become very important or very difficult to to deal with. And so, again, this just gets back to, you know, what you what you want to hear. Um, not everybody has to do character voices. Some of the best storytellers out there do not do character voices, but the way that they're able to engage the audience is amazing. And so um, the other thing I recommend is 
you know, don't just listen to the first five auditions that hit your inbox. Listen to the first 25 that hit your inbox. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, and, and you may hear someone that technically might not have a very good microphone or they didn't process their audio correctly, but they're a fantastic actor. Reach out to them and talk to them because there are plenty of resources to fix your tech. But a good actor, yeah. you know, it's it's amazing. You know, for, for those authors that want to try and narrate their own works, apply the same process to yourself. You know, narration is acting first, and that includes in nonfiction. Right. And uh, and it's something that that, you know, some authors say, well, I can read my own work because I know it the best. Well, sure you do. You know, but do you have the skill set? to engage the audience yeah. you now. Um, and well, so, you know, <laughs> well, I, I, mean, I will say that I have a, a long background in broadcasting, um, both television and, and radio. And I do a podcast every week and interviews. And I thought I might do my book. I wasn't sure, but I, I auditioned myself. So I read the same bit of script I gave other people. And I can tell you, <laughs> I failed my audition. I failed it spectacularly. And I knew straight away, I am not going to make an engaging read of this book. So beautiful that you did that. I love that. See, every author should do that. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I did it at the same time I sent it out to other people. I read read the bit and then I listened to it in the same way. And uh, yeah, I didn't get the job, unfortunately. But um, <laughs> a guy called Matt Addis got the job and he did a brilliant job. He did a brilliant job oh, of it. Great. And actually listening to Matt, listening to it, it's not, you know, there are bits when I kind of go, oh, is that, that's not how what I had in mind. But I understand that I've been around enough to know that at some point you have to seed some some creative control to a creative, right? That's how that process yep. works. You, you know, it really does. Writing books can be a bit of a solitary thing, but if you get involved in anything else, like making a record or making a film, for goodness sake, a film is like <laughs> the biggest collaboration on the planet, and you have to see creative control all over the place. And that's the beautiful thing about it in the end, right? That's why why it works. Yep. Yep. Well, I've done a multicast. Uh, one of the books I narrated, where I was the MC, and I no, had sorry, 14... multicast is almost where it's like a play rather than a narrate a single narrator. Yeah, that's the easiest way to describe it. I had 14 other narrators in wow. four different countries, Wow! which was, oh, it was a ton of fun. And so basically what happens is the main character usually is the narrator and does their own dialogue. And then every other actor that you bring in only does their dialogue. So there's still one narrative voice. Gotcha. Um, so the radio play analogy works up to that point where it diverges is that audiobooks still don't do a ton of sound effects and music. We're seeing some of that, especially in the science fiction area, but very little of it in the other genres. Yeah. It's I exciting think, to yeah. think how many different formats your original novel could end up being, isn't it? Because Yes. <laughs> so I think I was on audiobook now. There's nothing left, but there's loads left. There's um yeah, there's, there's multicasters, as you say, which is the next yes. exciting thing. But yes. yeah, and of course when Spielberg wants to make the film of my book. I there mean, you go. And okay. then there are there, you know, you talk about other companies that are doing this. There's you know, there's a couple of audio companies that specialize only in doing these full blown mm. Music and sound effects. Uh, I'll give a shout out to Sound Booth Theater. Um, you know, they're great friends of ours and they actually have composers as part of their roster. Wow. And that's all these people do is write music for all of the, the science fiction that they put out. Now, if it's people, amazing. If people are going to come to you on the 75% uh, royalty option so that they would be funding the uh, production, is, is the way you work, you basically do the production and give them an invoice or, you know, whichever way that Correct. works. Okay, rather than, rather than them turning up with their pre-produced material or could that happen as well or? They could do that. Yeah, they could okay. they could do that. And then we would do the we could do the engineering and mastering and distribution. Um, I don't really want to become a distribution house. Yeah. Okay. Uh, only I, I really kind of like the hybrid model. But, you know, I have done it for a few people and, you know, I will continue to do but your so, skill but... set is in the production side um, as much as anything else. Yes. OK, so so yes. so how much does it cost? To, I mean, I, I know it's a movable feast, but can you give uh, <laughs> could give listeners an idea of this? So, uh, the costs really uh, come down to a few things. Um, one, uh, 
there is a union for audiobook narrators. And so most of your big names, your Ray Porter, your R.C. Bray, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, Johnny Heller, uh, you know, those folks, they are all union. And so you have to pay them their base union rate or higher um, and you have to pay their pension and health. So, you know, and on the so on the high end, you know, you're looking at, you know, like Luke Daniels, you know, I mean, he may bill 800 or 1200 per finished hour. Right. You know? Um, but it usually starts at about 250 for union. OK. And then it goes up from there um, on the non-union side. Um, you don't have to do the pension and health. You don't have to go through the union. You're just paying the narrator directly. And those folks are usually 190 to, to 250. You know. Um, and then you will get folks who are willing to do the royalty share the same way it exists on ACX. You can do that. Uh, I know we do royalty share. I know Pink Flamingo Productions, which does mostly romance. They do royalty share with narrators, um, you know, you've really got to have the, the, the back end on the bookkeeping to be able to do that. And, you know, that way you give the narrator a stipend and then split the royalties. Okay. So usually those are about the three ways to do it. And then, of course, if you use ACX, you do have the full royalty share option where authors don't pay anything up front. And it used to work out really well, but ACX has been flooded with scam authors so much over the last three years that it's made it really difficult for anyone to get the royalty share model to work very well in, in the past few years. Like I said, years ago, it was great. And for those of us narrators who took the risk and are holding those older titles, it's great, you know. But uh, again, you know, ACX has some issues and, and they really need to work through them before. You're saying it doesn't work so well anymore for the, for the narrators or for the authors or for both? Well, really for the narrators, because they <laughs> because they're the ones taking all the risk up front, because narrators actually have to pay a proofer and they have to pay an engineer to master their audio. So if they're working independently, they're actually paying money to narrate your book before they see a dime. And so uh, for royalty share authors, you know, if if they're if they want to go down that road, then they basically have to have a really high profile book yeah. and it's got to be paid rank. It can't be free rank. It's got to be it's got to be a paid rank that you know, is sitting in the top 100 in good categories. And, you know, the, you know, the sales numbers have got to be sitting around a thousand or under in order for royalty share to really be worth it for a narrator. Well, the overall um, Amazon chart. Right, yeah. right. If you're yeah. just going off the, off the Amazon rank and the Amazon yeah. charts. Yeah. Okay. You know, but again, well, you know, there's, there's a lot of options out there. So, and I know that Find A Way has, uh, they've basically got a competitive platform to ACX that hasn't quite rolled out a full royalty share option, but it does have the royalty share plus option. So authors can do sort of a reduced buy-in to getting their audio book produced. Yeah. Um, and the distribution side, let's just, talk about sure. that for a little bit because this is i mean it is complicated isn't it you, you you rattled off some of the the retailers um just now where where does a, an author start with this <laughs> i mean through your company okay. i guess is the best thing right right right. well uh, yeah sure i mean <laughs> that's the thing yes they can you know obviously come to spectrum um but you can also go you know you can go down the road of basically becoming your own distributor and cutting your own deals, or you can choose one of the two larger aggregators. Find a way obviously is one, but again, with the whole Spotify acquisition, it's hard to say what they're going to do and, and how the royalty rates are going to change. So uh, all my information on that is older. Now, Ingram Spark 
uh, does have an audiobook distribution side. The problem with it is, is that you have to have a sizable catalog to do Ingram Spark. So you can't, I know a lot of people use it for print and you can, you can just have one or two books and use it for print and ebook and it's great. But on the audio side, they really want you to have at least a, you know, a good 70 to 100 titles in your catalog before they'll let you on the audiobook platform. So, you know, uh, a Craig Martell who's got, you know, a huge back catalog, that's a great platform for him to do wide distribution. Um, you know, or any other authors like that who've got these huge, huge multi book series that run, you know, 17, 25 books in a single series, you know. Uh, that's great for them. And, uh, you know, and then that way they kind of have one stop shopping. They get access to the largest uh, platforms in wide distribution. So it's your Kobo, your Overdrive, Libby, Hoopla, Libro.fm, which goes to um, uh, bookstores.com, Storytel, Biblioteca, you know, all of these larger platforms. Barnes and Noble is its own entity. You have to do Barnes and Noble on your own as a single deal. Google Play, you'll get the best money if you do Google Play on your own. You'll get 90%. Um, it, but you, the hoops that you have to jump through to get on Google Play are particularly difficult. Right. So this is why it gets back to your earlier point about how long it takes to get in wide distribution. You know, it takes Google about seven to nine months just to approve you to get on the platform. Wow. Yeah, it's it's really a pain and you have to constantly submit in information to them. It's really right. it's, it doesn't sound fun. Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> OK, so finally, what is next for Spectrum uh, specifically and audiobooks in, in general, do you think? <laughs> well, um, like I said, you know, we've we've got the Roku platform underway. We've got, you know, the the other two that are going to become a phase two and a phase three. Um, I definitely want to expand out ebook and print offerings um, and fight the good fight against AI. That's, you know, I. The, I, the robots are coming. Really? <laughs> Kill all humans. And, you know, I'm I'm not afraid of technology, obviously, <laughs> since I use so much of it to do this. But, you know, it uh, it's it's something that's really shaking up the community. And I basically want to you know hold the line. And <laughs> yeah, I know some people are very excited, the, the good fight. excited about this and, and other people dread it. But uh, I think when you talked <laughs> earlier about the craft of narration, about telling the story, it seems unlikely to me that we're anywhere close to artificial intelligence recreating that it might be able to read the book out and it might sometimes be hard to tell if it's a human but to bring that heart to a narration i hope for for some time to come that's a human's job oh, well same here <laughs> <laughs> we'll see um kelly what fun talking to you um an appetite for me yeah, having just you, gone James. through this process um and i know it's something i know that there are authors they often say it to me that i just haven't started this process yet i know it's money on the table but um it's i think it's becoming clearer to me and hopefully this interview has made a bit clearer to other people what the landscape looks like so that well, was thanks great. again for the time and i really appreciate it <laughs> hey no, we do too oh yeah i should say one Ooh. more thing i think you did maybe talk about having a pdf a helpful pdf uh that would that would yes would be useful i have i will send you uh my presentation uh that i had at 20 books to 50k okay i know i've got it up in the group but i'll send it to you directly and you're welcome to distribute that yeah you know it's got a ton of information in it and and should be quite helpful great and uh yeah okay well so. thank you well i sat through the session 20 books so i can say it was a very useful uh, very useful session for me i made lots of notes oh great great <laughs> <laughs> now well, did you attend in person or yes. were you able to come over okay great great yeah no i was there we actually we actually flew i mean it looks now like it might be in a window of opportunity when we <laughs> we're allowed to leave the country but uh, who knows right right yeah, yeah. anyway let's park that one for now brilliant kelly thank you so much indeed for coming thank you on. thank you so much all right enjoy the rest of your day bye now james 
This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There you go, Kelly Wren. So, uh, where are your, all your books and audiobook? Are you still self-publishing your audiobooks, or have you sold those rights to Tantor? No. Was it? I think. Or? No, I, I have um, uh, deals with Tantor in the US and WF House in the UK. So they're owned by the same um, parent company, um, Recorded Media, I think it is. So a big uh, multinational. So that, that for me, it's just been the. I mean, I, I would I make more money doing it myself. Probably I would, um, but they're really good um, and they take it off my plate, which is something that I don't have to worry about, which is there's a value to that for me. Um, and I like working with them. So it, it's, it's been it's been pretty good that way. Um, and I'm, I'm not thinking about doing it myself, even though obviously it's pretty easy these days to do that. Yeah. Well, I outsource mine to uh, a company called Chocolate Fox Audio, uh, which is basically Matt Addis is the narrator and he has a team around him. Um, he was suggested to me by a listener actually to the show, somebody whose voice would fit my book. And uh, I listened to him straight away and thought, yep, that definitely would work. I had a really good conversation with him. We explained the entire process, how his producer works, how he works with the producer, or how they would work with me, and everything he said happened. There was a little bit of interruption for COVID, of course, but we had uh, detailed conversations about characters, uh, about parts of the world, about pronunciations of names, whether I'd made them up, whether they're real. Uh, he helped me out with finding a few things in the book, inconsistencies, which, of course, in any novel, you know, when someone else has a fresh pair of eyes, you find a couple of things there, which we we uh, smartened out. And I'm really, really pleased with the feedback I've had so far. Apparently, his pronunciations are very good. I did find it weird hearing the characters I'd created being voiced by somebody, but I think it's a very important part of what we do when it, we grow a little bit into bigger services is to seed creativity to somebody else to mm -hmm. interpret your story. And so um, JK Rowling had to do it with Harry Potter, right? And, and um, Peter Benchley with Jaws. So I'm sure you and I can do it with our, our books and just let somebody else interpret things rather than be too nitty about it. So good. Well, thank choice you. choice of two authors there. Yeah, no, that's, we a, know. That's, that's an insight into the way your brain works. JK Rowling and Jaws. Mm, I don't quite, weird. I'm trying to think of book, big book adaptations. They're the two that came to me. <laughs> There are others. Other books have been adapted. Yes. Pe perhaps Ian McEwen should have been a little bit more on top of Atonement, but there you go, <laughs> which was not a great adaptation. We could have a discussion, can we, of good and bad adaptations, but running out of time. And, uh, yeah, we are running out of time because we've got another episode to record in a minute, you and me. But I do want to say thank you to Kelly Wren for coming on. She was a very um, enthusiastic uh, interviewee, and I, I learned a lot about uh audiobooks i hope you did too and uh we have our tiktok challenge starting in a couple of days i think we're going to start it in something like the fifth of yeah wednesday the fifth so that's next wednesday uh, from where we're, where you're listening to this if you're listening to it on release day uh so that url again selfpublishingformula.com forward slash tick tock tick tock tick tock Time, time's moving on Yes, it is. Actually, okay. Actually, given that this is the Chris, the New Year's Eve show, TikTok is a very appropriate way to end it. it so, is. Uh, well, well done, Joe. That, that was a that was a smooth Sieg, smooth Sieg. and sophisticated Sieg. Look out! Did I say Sieg? It's Segway. So that's well, pronounced. You, you ride those. I, I'll, I'll you ride your Segway. I'll I'll use words from the dictionary that are correct in the way I use them. Thank you. I very think much. I'm going to wrap things up now. Uh, so all that remains for me to say for 2021 is thank you very much indeed for being with us uh, for this year. And we look forward to continuing through 2022 and helping you with your career as an author. Uh, and that's it. All that remains for me to say, therefore, is it's goodbye and happy new year from me. And happy new year from me. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing, so get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.